food. Um, so they're removing carbon that, that we burn through fossil fuel use in the atmosphere. They're taking that carbon and sequestering it as, as part of their bodies. Um, also by doing so, they're using the sun's solar radiation to do that work. So they provide shade and a cooling effect because they are using the sun's energy to push those carbon molecules together to create those simple sugars. Um, so I'm sure you've noticed standing in the shade is a lot cooler than standing in the sun. Um, and trees help provide a lot of those uh, shade benefits that we need in an urban forest. If you think about how the sun interacts with um, hardscape, asphalt, concrete, um, there's no work being done. The sun is hitting those hard surfaces and then that heat is just radiating back up into our environment. So that sh those shade benefits are especially important. Um, they also provide water benefits. Uh, they help um, water incorporate into soil systems. If you think about our soil systems as a gigantic sponge. Oh, sorry about that. If you think about our soil systems as a gigantic sponge, um, getting water to incorporate into that sponge is really important. I'm sure you've noticed during rain events, um, water may rush across our hardscapes, across asphalt, across um, in our roads, and it rushes right on out of here. Here in the Bay Area, that water will fall and it'll rush down into the stream and off it goes into the Bay. Um, but if we can get that water to incorporate into soil systems, it drastically slows down the movement and slowing down that water is really key. So getting, having more green space, having more soil space that trees can intercept that water and then have it absorb into soil systems is a benefit for all of us because we all rely on groundwater sources. Um, trees also provide benefits in terms of cleaning the air. Um, trees, especially ones with like hairy leaves or lots of surface area can actually remove particulate matter. So if you think about those fires that we had in 2020 here in the Bay Area, um, those plants, those trees are actually removing particulate matter um, from the atmosphere. Um, so they provide so many benefits and there's lots of research to quantify in terms of money, how much these benefits save us or um, help us, you know, and I, I like to use the term ecosystem benefits as, a, as opposed to ecosystem services. Uh, the ecosystem, we live in reciprocity with it. So the things that we do for the ecosystem, it provides back in reciprocity to us. So there are many ecosystem benefits to the urban forest. Um, and if we think about moving forward, um, the climate that we're looking at here in California is meant to get hotter temperatures and less rain. So anything that we can do to combat those temperatures and to capture as much of that rain as we can um, moving forward will benefit all of us. Um, we live in an ecosystem, not just with us, but with lots of other people and plants and animals. So making sure that we have trees in our urban systems is vital to helping us move forward and create a more sustainable future and a, a more a future where, we're, where we're, we have to repair our relationship with our urban environment a little bit. You know, um, many of these concepts are kind of new and moving forward, it takes many decades to establish a canopy. So making these plans now to get trees installed, especially in low income neighborhoods, especially in communities of color, those canopies need to be developed now so that in 30 years, when we look back at what we did in 2020, we don't see this gap in our canopy. You know, when I look back at, you know, when I'm in 2050, looking at where the, the gaps are in our canopy, I wanna make sure that, you know, we made the right choices that we planted trees where they need to be because those canopies do take times, time to develop. Um, other benefits of trees that aren't as quantified but are still being researched is these public health benefits. So for instance, uh, people who live near trees uh, oftentimes have less asthma rates than people who live without trees nearby. Um, this is obvious, cars and burning fossil fuels creates pollution and that pollution harms um, our lungs. If you think about like all of the tires that run on the road and all of that rubber that just gets like turned up into the atmosphere, all of those particulates, all of the, the um, uh, pollution that we have to deal with in urban settings, uh, it's like, thank goodness there are trees, there are, there are beings here to help us um, to, live, to live better here. There are also mental health benefits. You know, these aren't as quantified as, you know, some environmental 
benefits, but they they are there. You know, you see less um, violence in neighborhoods with uh, good tree canopy. You see less car accidents in uh, neighborhoods with higher tree canopy. You see uh, less rates of depression. Um, there's a lot of social cohesion that happens in, in high canopy neighborhoods. So a lot of this is, is still being researched. So in urban settings, we are responsible for the stewardship of all trees. There's very little natural germination of trees that we would just allow. So if I think about um, some of my trees that might germinate naturally, if I think about like a golden rain tree, Corutaria paniculata, um, they might, you might see some seedlings, I mean, you know, arrive in your yard. All trees produce um, seeds, that's how they reproduce, and some of those seeds germinate. But in the urban forest, we, very, we, we rarely allow a tree to just germinate and be wherever it, wherever it germinated. Um, that's not really how we manage the urban forest. We have very specific placement needs in an urban forest. We have roads, we have power lines, we have water lines, we have um, gas lines, we have communication lines, all sorts of different things that we need to make sure that when a tree goes in a specific location, that it's going to work for the next 20 to 50 years. So most, if not all, trees in urban settings are placed there by humans, not just naturally germinating like in a natural forest. So what do trees need at first? Well, they, they need a little bit of water. If you think about a tree or a plant inside of a pot or a container that you would buy from a nursery, that tree or that plant has a you know, reduced root system. It's not as big or as developed as it should be because it's growing in a pot in a container. It's, it's stuck inside the walls of that plastic pot. So right away, when we put our trees and plants in the ground, they're, they're starting off needing our help because they have a underdeveloped root system. A typical tree or plant, their above ground biomass should match their below ground biomass. That means for as much tree as you see, there's that much tree beneath the ground. But when we place a new potted tree in our urban system, that's not the case. It's a very small pot compared to that big tree. So we want to provide enough water to become established. Most trees that we plant, especially here in the Bay Area and in throughout California, are some sort of drought tolerant tree. They really wouldn't be able to survive many months without rain without some sort of drought resistance or drought tolerance. So we do select appropriate species. However, they still need a little bit of water to grow that initial first maybe two to three years to get that root system to grow deep enough. So here we have some of our needs of trees. So usually when you plant a tree in the urban forest, it comes with a stake or three stakes or two stakes, whatever the arrangement is. This is just to hold the tree up for things like the wind, things like vandalism, things that you don't even know about. Um, this is just to hold the tree in place for the first two to three years. Pruning. A tree in the urban forest needs pruned. I'm sure it's happened to all of us. We're walking along the sidewalk and then suddenly psh, a big branch hits us in the face. Um, trees need to be pruned so that pedestrians can walk underneath them an eight foot clearance so that your trash trucks and your UPS trucks can drive in the road next to them, a 14 foot clearance. So we train the tree into a specific shape for both safety and to use in the urban forest. Um, mulch, mulch is super important. If you think about a natural forest, there's very rarely just naked soil, just bare soil sitting about. There's always debris and things falling from the forest canopy onto the ground. That organic material decomposes, it adds back nutrients to the soil. So that's what we're doing with mulch. We're using mulch to insulate the soil, create a protective barrier, protect it from sun, keep moisture inside. It acts like a blanket. Um, so this is a protective barrier and it breaks down and adds nutrients to the soil. The other thing our trees need is a nice berm. Other parts of California and here have high clay content in our soils. Well, I'm sure everybody has noticed when you go to water your tree or your plant, sometimes that soil doesn't instantly absorb that water and you might have it run off the surface. That's just because clay-like soils have a lot of small little uh, pores and those pores take a second to accept the groundwater. So a nice fat berm or like an upside down donut ring of dirt or mulch is really beneficial to help keep that water on the root ball. So 
I'm gonna circle back to watering. Trees would need a little bit more water that first and second year after you plant it. And then it can start to be weaned off in the third and fourth year. Um, at our city forest, we recommend that any sort of tree that gets planted immediately gets water. That's 10 to 15 gallons of water. If you think about a plain white bucket, that's about five gallons. So two to three full white buckets or any sort of colored bucket, the classic one, that's about five gallons. So every tree gets 10 to 15 gallons right after you plant it. Um, after that, we recommend about 10 to 15 gallons weekly. Now, infrequent deep watering is always better than infrequent shallow watering. What do I mean by this? I mean that it is much better to walk over to that tree once a week or once every other week and add 15 gallons of water all at once. So a bucket or a hose or some way that gives that water all at once is way more beneficial than something like a, like a spray irrigation system that might give, you know, a gallon a day. When you give a tree a gallon a day, the roots of a tree can be trained just like the tops of the tree can be trained. So we can prune branches. We can tell a tree where to grow, where not to grow. It's the same thing with underground. By giving a tree deep, infrequent water, you're saturating the soil column underneath the tree. You're teaching the tree, I need to grow straight down into the soil. I need to keep going down there. It's prompted to keep following the water. If you do shallow root watering that's frequent, you're teaching the tree that you don't need to grow down into the soil because there's no water down there. All of the water is here at the surface. There's no need to grow down any further. So this is why people get issues with their sidewalk. Um, it's because someone planted a tree in the park strip and then they have some sort of lawn or turf that they're watering with overhead sprinklers on the other side of the sidewalk. Well, the tree can just go underneath that sidewalk. It's all soil underneath. All the tree is gonna do is follow the water. We're training the tree where to go. Deep, infrequent water is much more beneficial. You're training the tree to grow deep. In some places, especially here in Santa Clara Valley, the trees can sometimes reach the water table. Um, it depends on your area, but some trees, especially the oaks, have deep root systems and they have all the water they need. After that fourth year, as soon as you remove the stakes, most trees are completely drought resistant. Some trees are more drought tolerant. They will tolerate the drought and some will resist the drought they should all be fine with the amount of rain that we get naturally. Every species is different. I saw a great question in the chat about a magnolia tree. Here in the Bay Area, we've, we're kind of weaning off planting magnolia grandiflora because of its water needs. Every tree is gonna be different, but there are some trees that are more drought tolerant than others. That magnolia tree is from uh, Southeast US. Uh, the American Southeast gets plenty of rain. So I'm sure you've noticed uh, some of those magnolias and birches that we plant in the landscape are looking a little sparse, a little thin. They're, they're, the foliar density isn't as high. And that's because through time, they're just not getting the water that they need in comparison to their native range. So we look to grab specific trees that have correct water needs for our area moving forward in time because trees can live decades and we wanna make sure that we're setting them up for success. So I'm gonna circle back to each of those um, parts of caring for trees. Um, this mulch is super important. It breaks down and it nourishes the soil. It suppresses weeds. So if you create that, that layer of mulch, weeds will have to fight up three inches without light to try to, to try to germinate. So it suppresses the weeds. It conserves water. Like I said, it acts like a blanket. It keeps the water underneath. So the hot sun bakes all of those mulch chips, all of those little pieces of dead tree instead of baking the soil underneath it. Our soils are alive. We wanna keep them as moist as possible. They have lots of beneficial bacteria and fungus and, and root networks. And that mulch layer helps keep that soil just a little bit more, help retain that moisture. So by doing so, it also helps regulate the temperature. So if you lift it up three inches of mulch and touch that dirt underneath, it would actually be cooler on a hot summer day than without the mulch layer. This makes a lot of sense, right? That 
mulch acts like a blanket. It insulates it. It keeps the temperatures from going up and down too fast with exposure to the sunlight. We all know it's the sun that's making it hot. So if we protect our soils from the sun, it helps keep water inside and it helps keep the temperature low. It also helps prevent erosion. If you think about a drop of water falling from the sky, it can fall pretty fast. And if it hits a thing of mulch or a wood chip of mulch, it's not going to displace a lot of the um, the aggregates of the soil. But if you allow rain to hit just bare soil, I'm sure all of us have noticed how that soil just sort of washes away. So mulch helps prevent erosion, it helps keep everything in place and protects our soil from the elements. Um, the berm is really important too. Like I said, we have very clay-like soils here in Santa Clara Valley. So it's important to create this little berm, kind of making a, a dish, a little bowl for the water to sit in. It's like I said, it's difficult to water sometimes. It runs off the surface of the soil and into the street or something. And that's not what we want. So we want to make like this upside down donut shape around the tree to make like a bowl so that the water is consolidated right on the roots, especially for young trees to grow down. Now in my picture to the left, the berm is a little small. Um, your berm should extend to the, to the drip line. Your berm and mulch should extend to the, the drip line of the tree. So where the edges of the canopy is. I work a lot of times with smaller trees. So this is like a, a good size berm, um, but it should be about as wide as the canopy of your tree. Um, be careful not to do the volcano mulch. That's when people like push the mulch up against the trunk. You're just keeping a lot of moisture up against the trunks of trees and trees grow at a certain height for a reason. You know, the trunk is above ground because it needs to be above ground and the roots are below ground because they need to be below ground. If you take a part of the tree's biology and make it think that it's below ground, you're gonna get tons of problems. There's gonna be rot, there's gonna be fungus that moves in. There's gonna be lots of problems with um, the structural integrity of that trunk if you put a bunch of um, mulch too high on the trunk like that. So your tree should be planted. So the root flare is right at the surface of the soil. Your first woody root is about one inch down. And that's where trees like to be. A naturally germinated tree will place itself where it should be. But like I said, all trees in the urban environment are planted by people. So we have to do it correctly. Um, just for anybody who's interested in you know, soil horizons, you have this organic layer. That's your debris that falls on top that decomposes to become that organic layer. If we never put mulch down, we will never have an organic layer. There needs to be inputs in a system to have outputs. So if you want the tree to be sucking up nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium from the soil, there needs to be some input, you know, we there need the, the, close the loop. So there needs to be some sort of mulch that's breaking down over time, adding nutrients back to the soil so that your plants have nutrients in the soil in, in years to come to send to the, to the tree. Um, most biology in the world only happens within the first six inches of soil there. Um, so it's really important that we take care of our topsoil, that we take care of our organic layer in our soil systems so that not only trees, but so that we, you know, can have agriculture so that we can have, you know, uh, uh, urban ecosystem that isn't just uh, asphalt and concrete. So here's a diagram that uh, our city forest uses to kind of illustrate what's going on below ground and above ground. Um, so here I have the hole that was dug to install this tree. We have the root ball um, for the container right there. Uh, we always dig a hole that's about two times as wide as the pot of the tree. This is to allow the roots to start growing. Um, we always create these little berms. The berms are meant to hold the water in place for a while and we have a stake. So the stake is just meant to hold the tree up while its roots grow into the substrate. Um, we have different styles of stakes and everybody uses different ones. Um, sometimes if the tree is small enough, you don't need a stake. Um, in the urban environment, we have lots of um, high winds or you know, vandalism or weird things happen with cars. So the stake is just kind of meant to hold the tree in place um, as a temporary measure. Um, this stake should definitely be removed after three years. So I'm sure we've all seen trees around our urban environments that are, you know how they grow out around your, the objects. You don't want the tree to engulf any sort of metal or strap or anything like that. We don't want our trees to absorb uh, any of this sort of um, staking system. 
So you want to give the tree its space. You know, if you think about tree rings, each year the tree gets a little wider. You need to allow the tree to get a little wider so that its xylem and phloem can do its job. You know, sending water up to the canopy and the canopy sending sugars down to the roots. We don't want to girdle it or choke out the tree. So removing that stake is really important. It's only meant as a crutch for the first three years after planting. And then pruning. So pruning is very important, especially for urban trees to get that clearance for pedestrians and for cars. Um, there's a lot of great YouTube videos. I would check out Master Gardeners sort of resources or UC Extension Centers have great videos on how to prune trees um, because every tree is gonna be just a little different. There's differences between pruning a street tree and pruning a plum tree, for example. The way you prune fruit trees might be a little different. That being said, most trees can be shaped into whatever shape or design you really want. Most trees can be made into bonsai. Many trees can take a very natural form and just do scraggly whatever they want to do. So it's kind of up to us as stewards of the urban forest to kind of pick the design that works for us. Generally, for street trees, we like a design where we have a strong central leader, where there's one trunk that is holding a lot of the weight of the tree. And then we have scaffolding branches that move up as the tree ages. So we want a lot of that weight. Trees are heavy. I'm sure you've noticed if you've ever tried to move a log or something. Uh, we want that weight centered. That way, the, if there's a strong wind or anything, we will have less breaking branches, we'll have less um, damage to property or to, you know, any sort of vehicles or anything like that in the street. So we try to train the tree to have a central leader. And then we try to have scaffolding branches that aren't too, um, the, the angle isn't too tight. When you have a tree branch that's really tight like this, you know, tree branches get wider every year. And when you have a tree intersecting with another branch like that, they're gonna compete for space. So we try to give the tree as much space as it needs and steward its growth to create just a couple strong branches. Um, we have temporary branches that are beneath eight feet. So these are branches that we would allow a baby tree to have, but then we're gonna remove them as the tree ages. Um, and of course, with trees and any shrub, you can always remove, I call it the 3Ds, not the 4Ds, because dead and dying to me seem like redundant, but go with however many Ds that you can remember. But you can remove any dead, dying, diseased, or damaged branches. Those are always okay to remove. Um, get those out of there. Um, we, we don't need those. Uh, we, like I said, we're always trying to promote a central leader, uh, keep one guy real strong. Uh, we identify a lowest permanent branch. So here in San Jose, that's, that's eight feet over a walkway and 14 feet over a street. And then we try to give the tree ample branch spacing. That way each branch will develop a little beefier if it doesn't have to compete with itself. Trees and plants don't really have a brain, so they don't control where they send out new shoots. So it's kind of up to us to be like, this is the one we want to keep, and we're going to thin out the rest and so that it doesn't compete with itself. Um, like I said, there's some great videos online, UC Extension Centers, Master Gardeners, things like that. So the urban environment is, is just a different sort of space. Um, I'm sure you have all heard of the urban heat island effect. Like I said earlier in my presentation, this is when the sun heats up asphalt, um, cement, things like that. And so cities are often hotter than the surrounding rural areas around them. Other things trees have to deal with, compact soils, when we do development, all those big machinery that, you, that, that runs over the soil squishes all the air out. And when you squish all that air out of the soil, you also squish out all of its holding capacity for water. So if you think about the soil, if you think about this whole valley as a giant sponge, um, when we drive over it, we're like compacting all of it. So compact soils is really difficult for trees in the urban environment. And even some native trees won't tolerate super compact soils. If it gets too compact, there's no air space for respiration in the roots and there's no space for, for water to be. So compact soils are a big problem. Disturbed soils, so when they do development or things like that, that, that backhoe might have dumped a bunch of bedrock. You saw those soil layers I showed you earlier uh, in my previous um, page there. When you get a bunch of that rock, it doesn't have that topsoil, it doesn't have that organic material. So we have disturbed soils in urban settings and oftentimes they, they lack nutrients or they, they lack the same soil structure as the surrounding area. Um, so there's also this limited growth space. Uh, I'm sure we've all seen 
large tree species shoved in small growth spaces and then the tree just sort of rolls out on the sidewalk as the decades go on and and they're those come with costs, you know, we need to remove the sidewalk, fix the tree, you know. So limited growth space is indeed a problem. Uh, vandalism, you know, we live in urban settings and that comes with its fair share of social issues. Um, we're gonna have problems with, you know, from teenagers carving initials into trees, which, you know, it's right in the Cambrium layer. You give, give the trees a break um, to, to just, you know, traffic accidents or, you know, whatever happens. Um, we have this urban heat island effect, which not only affects us humans, but trees themselves. You know, if a tree is evolved to grow in a certain um, temperature, and then we we take it and put it in a you know a median of a large street, it's like I took that tree and I put it in the desert. It has compact soils. It's surrounded on all sides by concrete. It just has the pollution from the cars going back and forth. So the life of a median street tree is is very stressful. Um, it's really difficult for a, a street tree to establish. So we should all definitely appreciate when there's that nice large street tree giving us shade as we're going down the street. So we're gonna circle back to water for a second. Um, this is the most up-to-date map I could find for our current uh, drought situation um, in California. The entire state is in a drought and I believe the entire, most of the West, you know, so if I think about Washington, Oregon, Utah, Colorado, most of the Western states are in a state of drought at this moment. Um, so if you're not from Santa Clara County, you can find your county on this map to identify whether you're in a severe drought or an extreme drought. And I'm so sorry if you're in an exceptional drought. Um, these are stressful times. Um, we are experiencing climate change. We are experiencing just climate shifts in general that are, that are natural. Um, most of these shifts are expected to increase as we move forward. So we need to have plans to keep our urban forests alive, to keep our ecosystems alive, despite this extra stress. So trees and plants in our environment do alter our environment. Um, so this is a diagram on the left here of hydraulic redistribution. So this is when a tree or something with really deep roots can tap into a water table or can tap, tap into underground water sources and pulls that water up to that A and B layers of the soil. As it pulls that water up, it can kind of redistribute that water to a small degree laterally. Now, most water moves down because of gravity. So most water will enter our soil system and continue down until it hits some sort of non-permeable space in which it would, it would move. But trees can absorb water. They can pull water up because water is leaving their leaves from the canopy. So it's kind of acting like a straw. Trees can pull up that water from the water table and they can, to a degree, depending on your soil structure and the relationships and, and closeness of other plants, they can redistribute that water laterally. So if you have a really tall tree and then there's other sort of a shrub layer or an understory layer or a ground cover layer underneath, those plants will benefit from that tree being there because they will be able to have a little bit of water because that tree is pulling it up from deep water sources. This um, ecological effect doesn't happen in all soils or all situations but it can happen with our clay-like soils here. The particles are so close together that it can work as like a, a, against gravity to an extent that capillary action can be pulled up. The tree can pull it from the groundwater sources, especially those oaks, their root systems can really get down there and it can redistribute that laterally. So trees alter our environment actively. It's, it's happening. Um, Tree cover also prevents evapotranspiration from rivers, reservoirs, and soil. So if I went to plant a small shrub underneath a large oak tree, that soil will be cooler, and maybe it could be even wetter than the surrounding soils without um, any sort of canopy. So they are actively stopping as like a big umbrella, both the, the radiation of the sun pulling that water out of the soil and helping to protect other things like rivers, reservoirs, and things like that. 
Um, trees also slow water down. We, we've already talked about this and help facilitate that water into the groundwater sources. So the more trees there would be, the slower we can make that water move, the more we can integrate and percolate that soil into our groundwater sources. Um, here in Santa Clara uh, Valley, we get a lot of water from just groundwater sources. So we really rely on systems in place to incorporate that water and slow it down as much as possible. So trees are actively affecting how our environment feels and behaves. Um, one of those like fun facts, uh, most of the rain in the Amazon rainforest doesn't come in from like a low front from the ocean. You know, there's not big um, storm events that are crossing the Andes mountains and dipping into the Amazon basin and dumping rainwater. Most of the rain in the Amazon basin comes from the trees themselves. It's just like trees, transpiration into the atmosphere, it condenses, it becomes rain again. So the trees are actively shaping the amount of water in the Amazon basin. And if you remove those trees, the Amazon basin will no longer be a rainforest. There's not a lot of precipitation crossing the Andes and flowing into the Amazon basin. So if you think about how much water is stored inside of trees and how much, like multiply that by the, you know, hundreds of thousands of trees that exist or hopefully exist in your communities. Um, it's a big reservoir for water and it helps protect water in our, in our valleys. So I just have a little video of Trees Through Time. Um, the organization that I work for has been planting trees since 1994. Um, this is a picture of the Santa Clara Valley. So here is SJC, the airport. Um, this is the Santa Cruz mountain range. Um, these are the Diablo Mountains over here. And then this is the San Francisco Bay. As time moves forward, each dot represents a planting event. So each dot could represent between one and 25 trees. Now, what this video doesn't really show is the removal of trees. So it does a great job at showing our city forest's impact for planting trees. It, however, does not display the effect of development or the removal of mature trees. So each of these dots can represent one to 25 trees, right? Um, these are baby trees, though. So these are trees. I mean, we started planting in 1994. We're just hitting a point now, if you think about 30 years later, where this tree is, could be considered maybe a mature tree. That's how long the impact takes for these urban forestry projects. You plant this baby tree really for the homeowner after you, for the community after you. We won't see the impacts of many of our projects now. I'm looking at the investment from about 20 years ago. When I look at my street, I'm viewing a window into what in public investment happened or what trees were planted 20 years ago. So removing mature trees and replacing with baby trees isn't really an equal equation there. Um, the ecosystem benefits of mature trees is exponentially higher <laughs> than a baby tree. The surface area alone of a mature tree is exponentially higher. The amount of carbon it can sequester, the amount of pollution it can remove, the amount of water it can intercept, way higher. So removing tr mature trees is, is as big as a problem as, you know, how are we going to fund installing new trees? So the protection of mature trees is just as important as the planting of baby trees. So like I said, why continue to plant trees? So if you think about survivorship percentages, um, there's this amount of trees that we plant and then it will, con it will decline after that point. So say we planted 100,000 trees in 2021, that number will, the, that population of trees planted in 2021 will decline until there are no more. And this happens with all organisms on earth. If you think about um, all the people born in 1985, um, that number was capped uh, December 31st, 1985, and it will decline until there are no people left born in 1985. It's the same for trees. We have a certain number that we planted in a single year, and then that number will decrease through time. Trees have a high mortality rate at first. So if you think about this first 20 years, you're losing about half of the trees that you planted. 
So when I look outside my window and I'm looking at mature trees, those are about 50% of the ones that were actually planted. So um, tree, can or tree life expectancy just decreases pretty quick within 20 years and then kind of rounds out a little bit here. So we have how much water for, for humans, you know, on the left there, I have just typical uses of how much water and all of these numbers just come from various websites. You know, it really depends on what type of toilet you got, what type of shower head you got, um, if you have turf or not. Um, this is a lot of water for a human, um, a human being uh, to use this much water. Um, I'm sure all of my friends at Valley Water can kind of echo the, the sheer amount of water, you know, uh, I'm sure they all don't even think in gallons. It's just such a small uh, measuring unit, gallons. <laughs> but if I think about this, this is a lot of water and maybe this is every week or every day, you know, people definitely use the toilet every day. People definitely shower every day. Watering turf, I see it every day. Washing machine, maybe it's once a week, depending on your household size. Dishwasher, again, depending on your household size. Um, this is significant. Um, Think about that you're only one person and think about how many people are in your county. Here in Santa Clara County, it's over a million. This is tens of millions, hundreds of millions of gallons. It's pretty crazy. As I mentioned earlier, we, we work in reciprocity with our environment. So if we're using this much water, how much water are all the other plants and animals getting in our valley? It's a big question there. Um, it's very selfish of humans to think that every drop of water that falls from the sky we can use. Um, I'm sure when you think about it, it's like, well, obviously that can't happen. There's coyotes, there's trees, there's insects, you know, every animal and plant needs water. Um, so how is this a reciprocal relationship where humans, you know, pretty much hold and use all of this water, um, but plants and animals uh, aren't offered the same amount. Um, like I said earlier, a tree would require 10 to 15 gallons of water every week. That really is only between March and October, March and November. You know, once our, our winter rains hit, especially for deciduous trees, they lose their leaves. You don't need to water a defoliated tree. It's not using, it's not doing photosynthesis, it's dormant. So you don't need to worry about deciduous, watering deciduous trees. Um, so for someone to think that, you know, a tree doesn't deserve, you know, a, a sense of, of water um, is, is kind of odd to me, you know, that, that someone couldn't think about the, that reciprocity, that relationship that we form in our environment, you know, and, and what are the plants and animals that we live with? What do they deserve? You know, 15 gallons a week, I don't think is too much for the amount of ecosystem benefits that we would share with that organism. So that sycamore tree outside your house or that elm tree deserves that water. Um, it's entitled to that water. Um, and to limit it or to think that, you know, the, um, the cost or some sort of monetary cost or financial cost of water um, shouldn't really come to your mind too much. You know, um, money is, is a made up concept by humans that water, it, it, it deserves to go to the tree. 15 gallons, I don't think is that much when someone could take a 10 minute shower and use that much. And every individual taking a 10 minute shower every day can use that much. I think the trees deserve it. Um, but moving forward, I think it's really important to plant the right tree. Like I said, with magnolias and birch trees, I'm sure you've seen them looking a little scraggly in our communities. And that's because many of these uh, trees are either from an ecosystem that has plenty of rainfall, as is the case with Magnolia grandiflora. It's from the American Southeast, so it gets plenty of rain. Um, or like the birch trees. We do have native birch trees um, here in California, but there are riparian species. So as we build dams and restrict riparian habitat in our state, um, these sorts of trees aren't gonna really love living outside of riparian habitats. So your birch tree loves to have wet feet. Um, and when you don't offer it a lot of water, it's gonna decline slowly. So will this tree fit in the space? What are the water needs for this tree? And what are the pruning or common pests for this tree? Um, Cowscape is a great one that I like to look at. We can look at it later if we have time, um, but I highly recommend this site. Why don't I just click on it? Just, just, 
just for funsies. Um, Calscape is the, Nat the California Native Plant Society, and this guy will give you um, everything you need to know about native trees in our area. Uh, I linked it to the oak page. So these are all of the native oaks. Each one of these is a different um, species of oak. We are really blessed in California to have lots of different species. I can click on my favorite one. So if I clicked on valley oak, uh, Quercus lobata is actually one of the largest oak trees in North America. So we're really lucky. Look at that distribution. So it's definitely in hot areas in the Central Valley, just north of Bakersfield. It's in Los Angeles, it's in the mountains, it's in the Diablo range. So this is a tree that can grow in lots of different places. Um, you get a nice little, you know, bio of the tree. And then down here, you kind of get your fast facts. Like if you were at a nursery and you looked at the uh, facts on the tag, so you can see it can get 100 feet tall. Um, it's, its growth rate is there. Um, and then, if you come down here, where is it? Moisture need is low. So if you're looking to plant a tree, um, whether it's a street tree or a yard tree, I would come to this site, look at some natives. You know, native trees have survived here for thousands of years. Um, maybe they can survive another couple thousand years here, despite um, the influences humans have made for climate change. Um, but this moisture need is low. So look for trees that have this lower moisture need trees, especially this Quercus lobata, doesn't really like to be watered. Once you get this guy established, after two, maybe three years of 15 gallons a week, you can back off. This guy, all he would need is some, you know, pruning every 10, 15 years. Uh, that's all this, this one would need. Um, so really, it's just 15 gallons of water for the first two to three years. After that, don't water this oak tree. He don't like it. You can stop watering it. It'll be fine. It likes it. It likes to have dry roots. It can send down a big tap root. It has all the water it needs. So this is a great one that um, our city forest plants very frequently. Your coast live oak is probably the same way. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with this tree. Um, it's got some angry leaves, but I still like it. Again, the moisture is low. So this is a great oak tree to plant. Um, it's native. It's gonna tolerate these drier conditions. Um, it's not gonna get as tall as the Quercus lobata, you see here 25 to 82 feet tall. So make sure you're planting the right tree for the right place. There's always a, a good tree for the spot and Calscape is a great resource that I use um, to make sure that I'm, that I'm planting the right tree in the right place. Another one that I like is a select tree. So I'll put both links in the comments for you guys to, to grab and share. The select tree is a Cal Poly tool. It's a lot of fun. <clears throat> So these environmental issues become uh, social issues. You know, it's really important to continue to plant trees. Um, so an analogy that I made earlier was, um, imagine a year if, if everybody in California stopped having babies. You know, Mr. You know, Smith in first grade would just have one year where there were no first graders. There would just be an empty classroom because for one year we all decided to stop having babies. That's kind of what it would be like if we stopped planting trees. There would be like a gap in their population. We have like a population of kind of mature trees and then middle-aged trees and then, and then young trees. Like I said, the young trees are the largest group, but imagine if we just stopped planting trees because of the drought, there would be this gap in our age of trees. And for San Jose and most municipalities in California, canopy cover is going down. Despite efforts from the nonprofit that I work for to plant trees, we've planted over 70,000 trees, canopy cover is still going down. That's because we're, we're removing mature trees for development um, and all sorts of social issues come with this. Um, but environmental issues will become social issues. Um, it's, it's tied hand in hand. It's a more of a holistic view of the urban environment. Um, a great tool that I use is this tree equity score website. It does a great job in tying together uh, canopy benefits or um, current canopy coverage and other social issues in our communities. So you can see here, it's categorized by census tract. So every census tract has a designation. So if I look at a census tract that looks a bit orange to me, and I wonder why is the tree equity score so low? Um, you see the percent of people of color, 99%, um, a high unemployment rate a higher than normal health index, uh, kind of a high temperature here. So something about this census tract is telling me that there's some 
canopy issues that are also some social issues. Um, so there's something going on in this census tract. Um, it needs an increase of investment, especially towards its urban canopy. So this is a great little tool and I know it exists for most of the Bay Area. If I zoom out, I can see specific areas um, and you can see large trends. You know, you can see how San Leandro has more orange census tracts and Richmond has more orange census tracts and then Berkeley has more greener ones. So you can click on any of these guys and it'll spit out, you know, here we have less people of color, um, but we still have higher temperatures, um, but not a lot of the people in poverty here. So you can click any of these census tracts. It's a great little tool. Again, I'll post it in um, the chat, but it's a great one to look around to see how our environmental issues are interacting and playing with these social issues because they go hand in hand. And I am done with this presentation. I am more than happy to put these links in the chat and happy to answer any questions. And that's where I pulled some of my pictures. Thank you, Michael. That was incredible. I, I was, I really appreciate the context that you provide and, and your holistic view of tending to our earth and all that, all that she has to offer for us. I appreciate your presentation and your knowledge. Um, for everybody online right now, please know that this program has been recorded and I will follow up uh, with additional resources. Michael has a lot to share and Valley Water has a lot to offer. So stay tuned for that. Hopefully I can get that sent out by the end of the week. And my gosh, we actually have quite a few questions. Um, for anybody in the chat who has dropped any questions, please be sure you add them to the Q&A just so I can ensure that they are answered. Um, Michael, a question for you. We had a lot of inquiries around fruit trees, various types of fruit trees from plums to apples and then to an avocado. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about how you would suggest that folks schedule their irrigation. What would be your suggestions for ensuring new and old fruit trees are tended for? Sure, so generally fruit trees are a smaller um, tree species. So if you think about prunus, if you think about malice, those are your cherries and your apples and your, your plums. Um, they have a smaller canopy. They don't have as, an, as many environmental benefits to the community as a large canopy tree like an elm or a zelkova or a sycamore would have. Um, so they're purposefully kept short for easier to grab your fruits, um, and they do require a little bit more water through time. So if you do have an established fruit tree, it's probably still a good idea to give it supplemental water, um, but not as much as like 15 gallons a week. It would be like once a month or every other month providing it with a good soil soaking. Um, it wouldn't be as frequently as a newly planted tree. It definitely wouldn't be 15 gallons a week. Um, you can see uh, water stress on established trees. You'll see the margins or the edges of the tree leaves will start to get a little brown or a little yellow. Um, that's just a sign of scorch. And that's a sign that, okay, this tree needs, this mature tree needs water. Only young trees will wilt because older trees have like hard lignin and wood that holds them up and you won't notice the wilting as much. But if you start to see a little bit of that leaf scorch on the edges of the leaves, that's a sign that your tree needs a little bit more supplemental water. But again, I would still stick with deep root watering all at once, as opposed to shallow root watering. Um, that said, my organization doesn't use too many fruit trees. Um, there might, I might be saying like contradicting information. I would check with Master Gardeners for fruit trees. Um, so Master Gardeners is a nationwide organization that does more agricultural type stuff, especially urban agriculture type stuff. So they might have some better resources for watering, things like malice and prunus. Um, but Generally, I bet your fruits would, you'd get a better yield if you gave it a little bit more consistent water. So I'm sure our agricultural uh, people would probably recommend, you know, a consistent water through time, as opposed to just allowing your tree to just try to bear through the, the summer months. Um, avocado trees might be a little different. Uh, you have to look at where avocados come from. Uh, I think they get a little bit more natural rain, you know, in the, in the, places where they're natively from. But if I had a tree in question, I would try to find a um, fact page that told me where that tree was native to and try to match my watering regimen to that ecosystem. 
Um, you can also find some good drought tolerant cultivars. So they all have like their cutesy names, but it'll be like something like, um, we have a birch tree currently, we're trying to get a few birch trees in that are drought tolerant and they call it Dura Heat, Dura Heat Birch Tree. So there's some sort of cutesy name that might be at the nursery that you're shopping at that might give you a clue that it is a specifically bred cultivar to be more drought tolerant. Um, I know this exists for things like um, almonds um, and different nut trees have specific cultivars that are drought tolerant. Um, so that's what I would recommend. If you're installing a new fruit tree, look for a drought tolerant cultivar or ask your nursery if, if one is in production or is coming or something like that. For your established trees, I would, if you're actually getting yields, most fruit trees don't live that long. So they usually have like a peak and then they kind of peter out. Um, I would say give it consistent water, but nothing like a new baby tree. It would be like once a month, once every other month. Nice, thank you. And how lucky we are to have so many resources at our fingertips. Yes. Is a crepe myrtle water tolerant? Um, crepe myrtle is not the first uh, water tolerant as in like it, okay, like wet feet, like it likes being wet. I'm There's wondering if maybe they mean drought friendly. But sure. Maybe you so could answer both. Yeah, crepe myrtle is generally not drought tolerant the first five years after planting. Crepe myrtle is one of those that needs that weekly watering. You don't water your crepe myrtle in the first, you know, three years there, it's going to die. And it's just not going to make it. Um, once established, though, like I said, a lot of trees hang in there once established. So you need to train those roots to grow down deep. Once you do, I've, you know, there's some crepe myrtles on my block. I've never seen anybody even bat an eye at them. They, no one waters them. They're doing fine. They love it. Um, very compact conditions, you know, here in downtown San Jose. And they're doing great. But they, I've read that they do need water. Um, you, it's not one of those trees you can plop in the ground and walk away. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Karina brings up a great point that they have heard that mulch chips could be a fire hazard when they dry out. Do you want to speak to that at all? Sure. So my focus and our city forest focus is urban forestry. Um, you know, the risk of fire in urban settings is a lot lower than in rural settings. Uh, dried wood chips can pose a fire hazard. Um, so I would check with your municipality. I would check with your county. I would check with Cal Fire to see what they recommend for your county and area. Um, most of my recommendations are for places like city parks, places like along roads, um, places in downtown, you know, San Jose, or, you know, in very urban environments where risk of fire isn't uh, a big concern. Um, but it can be, it can catch fire. Even when I worked in Boston, um, there's a lot more cigarette smokers on the East Coast. And yeah, sometimes the mulch would catch fire when someone threw a cigarette out the window along the road or something like that. So it is dried wood chips, it can catch fire. Um, so I would check with your municipality about use of mulch um, or your area uh, because you don't wanna be feeding the fire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Really great points. And I think you touched on it's about your application process, where you apply, how you apply when you do have well hydrated soil and you keep at least five feet of defensible space, meaning you have no plantings up against your building. You're keeping at least five feet of it could be permeable rock. It could be concrete, but no planting. If you keep your soil healthy and you do keep your landscape irrigated, even if that's just twice a week based on your drought restrictions. I, my impression, my understanding is mulch can really help to keep that soil healthy and moist in comparison to a dried, dried lawn landscape, for example. And I think I just saw in the chat, um, we have Ellie Inslee joining us, who is a member of the Resilient Landscape Coalition, which is in Sonoma County. And they recommend that two to three inches of composted wood chips and fine mulch is okay. And as again, as long as you do allow for that defensible space, meaning at least five feet of no plantings on your building, um, it's about your application and how you tend to it. Really good question though. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the impacts of covering tree roots with landscape fabric or river rock. Um, generally with landscape fabric, I, I don't use it. Uh, I did a presentation for Daily Axe before. I never put plastic into the ground without having a plan to remove it. So it's okay to like put in some sort of drip irrigation because that's something you're going to maintain over time and hopefully something that you would remove if you're not using it. So I try not to use anything plastic 
that isn't that I don't have a plan to either maintain or to remove. Some of those landscape cloths are just polyester you know, sheets of plastic. So I, I try to work with the soil systems and I, I usually don't use it. Um, rock is a little different. It's a, it's a natural you know, material. Um, rock will heat up. So your tree will experience higher temperatures like up underneath it because the rock is gonna absorb the heat. It's not gonna do any work and the heat is just gonna re-radiate back underneath the tree. So that tree will need to be watered more if it's around a lot of hardscapes. So the rock acts just like asphalt or concrete would. It's gonna re-radiate that heat. So just make sure you're giving that tree um, a little bit more water, especially during um, July and August. Uh, but if it's an established tree, it should be okay. Again, don't pile up those rocks up against the trunk of the tree, you know, give it a little bit of space. Um, but rock mulch is, is, is a great alternative. Um, it can be used and it has, it has its, its use in the landscape. And when we're talking about the application of mulch, what type of mulch would you most often recommend? And I do appreciate that in the chat, Ellie also emphasized that gorilla hair mulch is typically the mulch that is most flammable. So I would just like to uplift that. Personally, Daily Axe would never recommend a gorilla hair mulch. And I'd be curious what our city forest typically uses. We go through a lot of mulch. So it's usually arborists wood chips. It's some sort of uh, tree care company that wants to ditch their wood chips for free and they, they, they give it to us. The only one I really reject is um, if the tree was taken down because of disease. So usually I can ask the, the arborist company or they're not gonna give it to us usually. I mean, it, they're, we're all acting in good faith. They usually don't give us diseased tree wood um, or eucalyptus. Eucalyptus is a, can be alleliopathic. It can create some compounds. I mean, it's, it's really smart. What it's doing is it's limiting weeds and other trees from competing with it. But when they take down that eucalyptus and chip up its mulch, um, that active chemical gets in your landscape and you kind of like introduce that chemical and, and a lot of your plants will start to die. So I reject any sort of eucalyptus mulch or mulch from a diseased tree, but just your classic wood chips. Um, I love when I get some redwood mulch, that's always tons of fun or a Douglas fir. Wow, so, so blessed. But outside of that, you know, if it's just like chunky, regular arborist mulch, I take it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, typically from um, a mulch supplier, we just go for the arbor mulch. It's usually a combination of various things, maybe redwood, fir, pine, alder, still works well, but yeah, you, you've certainly uplifted some of the really wonderful mulches when you're able to get them. Uh, so when you're watering a mature tree during the summer and during the drought, would you recommend using a soaker hose, perhaps positioned near the outer edge of the drip line of a plant, or maybe slightly inside or outside of the drip line? Uh, would you ever recommend a portable sprinkler, or do you have any other suggestions? Um, so it kind of depends on like the topography of what you're what you're watering. So a lot of trees, you know, might lift up the soil a little bit, and when you go to water it, it's just going to run away anyways. Um, there's no real point in watering a tree outside of the drip line. So wherever the canopy extends to, you know, if you made a straight line down, that's about where the roots should be. Um, so there's no real point in watering outside the drip line. I don't know if I would really recommend watering mature trees unless they're one of these trees that needs water through time, like a magnolia grandiflora, or like a birch, or like a, a hornbeam that might be from a riparian habitat anyways. So you're the trees that I just listed, you can go ahead and give them a little bit of water like once a month. It's the same with those fruit trees. It would just be like once a month, you just soak that area, 15 gallons, you know, let it soak through and then kind of walk away. Um, oak trees like don't want to be watered. <laughs> they're, they're acclimated to this climate. They're used to months without water. They will rot easier actually if you water them too much. So it depends on the species. Um, so if you use those little links that I put in the chat, to see where your tree comes from. Um, if it's a type of tree from an ecosystem that gets plenty of rain, it could benefit from a good 15 to 20 gallons of water uh, once a month if it's an established mature tree. Um, I would use whatever technique keeps the water around your tree roots. So, <laughs> so if you like go over there with a bucket and you just like dump the water bucket and it runs into the street, that was no help to anybody. Um, so whatever technique that you use that helps just like keep the water on the tree roots for that 10, 20 minutes you're watering, that's the one I would do. 
Just like keep the water on the roots. Don't allow it to run into the street. Don't allow it to go someplace else. If you need to make a little berm or if you need to water it slowly over like 40 minutes, do that. But just don't let that water just like run into the street because that doesn't really help anyone. Mm -hmm. Any chance you have to keep water on site, that's the best option. Um, great points, Michael. Thank you. We've had a couple people asking in the Q&A about like street trees and street trees um, conditions and removal of street trees. JD has a specific question about crepe myrtle or red leaf maple as the options that the city is looking at to replace um, a previously mature tree. Do you have any opinions on which might be better for the drought and or for shade purposes? Sure. So for ecosystem benefits or shade benefits, always choose the largest tree you can. Um, I see a lot of crepe myrtles in places where I think, man, that canopy could be double, could be triple that size. Crepe myrtles are really great for um, like underneath a power line. You have one of these old neighborhoods that have those low power lines. You know, a, a little crepe myrtle is perfect. You won't have that that intersection or growing up into the power line. If there's no power lines up there and you've got a nice six foot wide park strip, put the largest tree you can look for that valley oak look for a linden look for you know look for a ginkgo that will really give you the most amount of shade the most amount of environmental benefits um tree removals and replacements especially for tree tre street trees are usually regulated by the municipality so you might need a permit especially if it's within 10 feet of the road that public right of way sort of area some municipalities or counties regulate that space and some don't so you might need a permit to remove that tree and to replace it. You might not need a permit at all if you're in unincorporated territory. Um, it kind of is up to the municipality of where you live um, because the municipality might have an approved street tree list. Like they might say like, oh, you can't plant that one. We've had tons of problems with that one, it, invasive roots, or that one spread seeds like nobody's business. We don't plant that one anymore. So it might be, um, there might be a short list that they create for you. Um, that's the way it is, at least in San Jose. There's an approved street tree list. And um, we try to stick with the, the municipality in terms of what you know, they want, um, but also what you want. You know? Make sure if you want flowers, you know, look, uh, use some of these tools that I posted and you can filter for flowers. You can filter for deciduous or evergreen or native or non-native. So um, take the opportunity to learn a little bit about trees and then pick the one that, that works for you. Um, there's always the right tree for the right place. Mm -hmm. And in that same vein, so if somebody has a, tr uh, like a water thirsty tree, like the magnolia, for example, what would you say would be the best way to transition to a more drought tolerant tree? You know, would you suggest that they remove that tree? If they remove that tree, are there any sort of concerns around the roots and how that affects the new tree? Do you have any advice for how to move forward with that? Sure. So for any of those trees that I mentioned, like magnolia, I would say keep it while you have it and enjoy it. Uh, try to give it a little bit of supplemental water through time. So if you do have a magnolia grandiflora, uh, help that guy out and give him a good soaking once a month because that's what that's what they're used to. You know, that tree came from an environment that has um, plenty of water. So it could just be helpful to give that tree. We wanna keep as many mature trees in our environment as possible. Like I said earlier in my presentation, we don't wanna remove mature trees and replace with young trees. That it takes too long for that canopy to redevelop. You know, you're looking at decades. It's like not even for you anymore. It becomes for your kids or for the next homeowner or for the next generation, which is great, but keep that tree while you have it. It's not really worth it to take it out or to remove it. Um, if you are, if you already have a dead tree, um, I usually don't recommend replacing a tree with the exact same species, just in case there was some sort of pathogen there, just in case something is getting, you know, to it. Um, I would try to recommend some sort of um, street tree that is already in use in the area or look south. You know, I'm looking at a lot of Los Angeles type street tree lists because that climate I'm expecting to kind of move up in latitudes through time. So I'm looking at, you know, what are the popular street trees, you know, in some in Paso Robles. Uh, what are the popular street trees in San Luis Obispo? Um, those might be my choices in the next coming decades as the latitudes of, of weather patterns kind of shift northwards um, and just trees live so long. So I would just choose a tree that is gonna be drought tolerant right from the start. And um, I would use those fact sheets to confirm my choice. I'd be like, okay, 
other people have done this research for me. I don't need to reinvent the wheel. I can just look here and confirm that this tree is drought tolerant. It's native. It's used a lot in Southern California. So I think it'll do well here. Nice, thank you. If leaves are sprouting on the trunk of the tree, would you suggest that one remove them? So um, usually on mature trees, if uh, you get those suckers on the bottom or you have like a lot of growth from the bottom, it's a sign of stress. Um, so maybe the roots are hitting some sort of um, some sort of layer that they can't penetrate, you know, in the soil. You, you'll never know. Um, maybe there was some sort of a, a chemical. There's tons of problems. There could be invertebrates that are infecting it or some sort of bacteria that it's biting off. You know, uh, we never really know, but that's a sign of stress. When, when all of those like little suckers or things are pushing out from the bark, um, I would remove them. Uh, like I said, we prune trees so that there's clearance. If you leave them, they'll just develop into branches and the tree will reallocate resources into the lower branches instead of the upper branches. So you do wanna remove those sort of suckers. Um, hopefully you win the battle and the suckers go away and the tree redistributes um, resources to its canopy again, but it is a sign of stress. I did not know that, thank you. Uh, Justin has a really good question here in the chat. What are some options to keeping trees healthy without using drinking water, maybe gray water or rainwater? And then does Valley Water offer any rebates to help install these types of systems? Should I answer that one or does someone from Valley Water want to jump yeah, in? Yeah, I think if you want to go ahead and answer, I was kind of chatting with Mary there in the, the other breakout rooms. Go ahead and I'm happy to uh, tack on to anything too. Sure. So the Valley Water has a lot of rebate programs, and I'm sure if you're outside of Valley Water's district, your water company or your water supplier also offers these rebates. The whole state is trying to get people to use less water or to use water in a creative way. So Valley Water does offer a gray water rebate. So you can install gray water systems um, in your home. Um, it kind of goes around the toilet. So we're, we're talking about washing machine, dishwashers, um, things like that. We're not talking about um, water that can possibly have contaminants from um, human feces or anything like that. But those systems can be put into place and are a great alternative to drinking water. A lot of municipalities in the area are developing recycled water. So when our city forest waters street trees um, at our nursery, we're using recycled water. So this is a product from um, just the Santa Clara area we have access to recycled water. So we use that one whenever we can. It does have, I mean, same thing with your gray water, you're gonna have more salts, you're gonna have more um, small contaminants, but in my opinion, it's worth it to reuse that water with the salts, with the contaminants, it's, it's gonna be fine. It's better to use that than drinking water. I agree with the comment. Um, anything that we can do that isn't using the drinking water and is reusing water we've already used, you know, if you think about the, the ISS, you know, that's all the same water, just like recirculating up there. Um, we can make that happen in our homes where we're just sort of, oh, this, is, this, isn't, this isn't that dirty. We can use it for the trees, you know, or this isn't that bad. We can reuse it. Or, you know, the water company now is creating recycled water and we can access that. I'm sure you've seen signs in your communities that say like recycled water, don't drink, kind of smells a little fishy. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's the stuff right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, such an excellent question and overview of the, the different opportunities that are present in our own homes and with the water that we're already paying for once, might as well use it twice. Mary dropped in the chat, uh, if you go to watersavings.org, which I will also send in a follow-up resource, it gives a really wonderful list of all of the rebates and opportunities that Valley Water offers for residents to make this change. Um, I'll, I would also like to uplift that your washing machines actually produce a lot of a lot more water than you may think. I saw somebody dropped in the chat that um, a dishwasher that is an energy star can use four to six gallons per water, and that is a dishwasher. But if we're looking at a top loading washing mach machine, you can use between 30 or 40 gallons of water every single time you do the laundry. If it's an energy star, maybe it's using about 15 loads, and if it's a front loader, but that's a lot of water. So through Michael's presentation, you can be getting your fruit tree or your native tree really established with that gray water alone. Um, so really beautiful opportunity for water reuse. Oh, Lorraine, an interesting question here. Is ivy okay around a parking strip? 
I think that's what her question is getting at. I think they're referring to English ivy. Hedera helix is the genus and species. Um, I don't use that plant just because it it can kind of escape and get everywhere. Um, it is labeled invasive in many states. I don't think it's labeled so in California yet. Um, don't allow it to get too close to your tree. I'm sure you've seen the Hedera helix grow up your tree trunk and it latches on with these like intense roots. So you can have that sort of ground cover. It's good to have a ground cover. It protects the soil, it, you know. So just, just be on it. If you're putting in that English ivy, just make sure you're pruning it every year, that you're not allowing it to climb up your trees, that it's a ground cover to remain a ground cover and that you're not allowing it to escape into if, you're, if your property abuts to any sort of um, wildlife habitat or sort of like a native landscape, um, make sure you're on it. Don't let that ivy escape because it will and it takes over. Um, it, can, um, it can completely like choke out a, a, a forest. So as long as you're being a good steward and you're pruning it and maintaining it, it's fine. But just don't allow it anywhere near the trunk of your tree. Give it a good uh, three feet of space there. Nice, great suggestion. Um, if somebody has a newer tree that they're trying to get established and the directions read, give them deep and infrequent watering. Can you explain a little bit more about what that means to you? Um, even though this is a young tree and ideally will need less water in the future, what does it mean to give deep and infrequent watering as it, get, as, as it is getting established? Sure, so it, it's just telling you that that 15 gallons that it needs should come all at once. You shouldn't like distribute the 15 gallons over the seven days. You should give it 15 gallons in, in this one watering event. Um, Consider how rain events actually happen. Uh, a lot of times there's a huge influx of rain, saturates the soil systems in our area, and then there's just nothing for months. Um, we're, we're mimicking this sort of uh, precipitation event where you're saturating the root systems and then that root system area just kind of slowly dries out. We have a lot of clay in our soils in this area. It'll take a while for that soil to dry out. But what that deep watering does is it promotes a saturated soil column. If you think about like this is the top of the soil here and I'm, I'm in the dirt right now. It's saturating the soil column, training the tree to keep growing down into the soil. If you give that tree shallow watering, it's gonna learn that there's no water down there. I'm not gonna grow down there. I'm gonna grow right here. I'm gonna stay at the surface because that's where the water is. Why would it grow down into the soil? So that tag is just telling you that deep infrequent watering is better than shallow frequent watering. Thank you. Um, I know you've kind of touched on a many different resources that folks can look at in order to determine if a tree is native or not and, and their water needs, but can you speak to the water needs of a mature Japanese maple? Sure, so uh, I do, Japanese maple is up there with the birches and the magnolias of our landscape. Um, Japan gets adequate rainfall. So you're looking at a tree that, you know, evolved with the uh, temperate forests of Japan um, and we're putting it in a sh chaparral um, climate here. Uh, that Japanese maple will need consistent water through time. So that would be just like your magnolia or your birch. It would benefit from a good soaking once a month. Nice, thank you. Barbara is wondering if redwoods are native to Silicon Valley, and if so, how much water do they need? Um, this is a great question. A lot of people plant redwoods in the inside of this valley. Um, they're, they're just not gonna do well in here. Um, the redwoods really are a high water need plant. Um, I'm gonna say it just one more time so everybody hears. Redwoods require a lot of water. Um, they are not a drought tolerant plant. So I'm sure all of us have some row of redwoods where the tops are all dying um, near our houses. Um, this was a landscape kind of attempt to have like redwoods in our landscapes, but they really need that fog. They really need that coastal climate. That's why you only really find redwoods in a very specific part of the world where like right along this coastal range um, and not very many other places. So redwoods need a lot of water. Um, our city forest stopped planting them about a decade ago um, here in the valley. 
Uh, they just need more water than we can provide. And it's not just water, it's like water through time. It's like one of, it's like one of these organisms, one of these trees, one of these plants that, that need that extended water through time. And if it has these continuous drought events, we're gonna see the decline like we do, like we do see. We see the decline in all of our city parks and corporate you know, parks, you know, these, these big office areas that plant redwood trees. Um, I, it's just not a tree I would use in an interior valley of California. If you're in, you know, Los Gatos, if you're in Santa Cruz, if you're in um, San Francisco, if you're, you know, north of here, um, it could be a good choice, especially if you're within 10 miles of the coast, you get that fog. If not, it's not a tree that I would recommend. Oh, interesting. I, I like this follow-up question on this thread. Claudia is asking, at what point, if at all, do we need to worry about the dying redwood falling? Um, any sort of dead tree is a hazard. Uh, I would have an arborist assess your tree right away because if you suspect that it's dead, it's probably dead. Um, if it has no green leaves, if it has no green needles, um, if you're, if you can see through it, you know, most trees, we can't really see through. If you're seeing that foliar density sort of decline over years, it's a declining tree. And those are, that's a huge hazard, especially redwoods that can get very big and tall. You do not want that falling on your house, on your car, or any sort of uh, other property or person. Um, and those branches will fall. You'll get a big wind event and you'll, you'll have a bunch of debris underneath your, uh, your tree there. So I would have an arborist assess it right away. Um, there are sometimes rebate programs through municipalities to offset the costs of tree work, um, especially if your municipality doesn't um, provide services for street trees. Thank you. Um, if somebody has a mature plum and an apple tree next to a large live oak, how would you suggest they do their watering? Uh, there's a question here about do they need to water the plum and the apple tree? I'm making the assumption that they do, but I'd love to learn a little bit more about how you think that they can mitigate that. Sure, it kind of depends on the distance between all three trees. You know, I'm imagining that this person who planted this malice and prunus is a bit far away from the oak. The oak is quite, has a big, um, it's quite wide. It's a wide tree, especially the coast live oak. It can get wider than it is tall. Um, so I would assume that it, someone has done some planning here and then they are a bit removed. Um, but like I said, water moves very vertically in that soil column. So if you water your prunus and your malice, uh, usually the oak is fine because the water is gonna move down into that soil column. Now, if you have some sort of like sprinkler going all over all three trees, yeah, you might experience some um, root rot on the oak over time. Uh, but if you're doing like um, watering that's very precise, then you shouldn't have to worry about the oak tree. Thank you. Uh, I like Sarah's question here about our city forest. When you all are planting trees, what control do you all have to ensure that they are receiving water for at least two to three years when they are getting established? Yes, yeah, so we have a couple different models um, to make sure that we that trees are stewarded appropriately. So we have our classic stewardship model where we would go plant a tree for a senior at their in their park strip. You know, maybe they qualified for a free tree and a free planting from our city forest. You know, we have a Cal Fire grant or we have some funding from the county um, to assist low income people with planting trees. So we would have them sign a stewardship agreement and we'd walk them through the responsibilities of being a steward for the urban forest. And in that agreement, it says water the tree 10 to 15 gallons every week from March to November. Um, it says remove the stake after three years. Um, it says um, our city forest will send you a stewardship email once a year to check on that tree. So we're gonna follow up with you and be like, hey, how's that elm tree doing? Do you remember to water it every, you know, every week? Um, here's a little Google form if you'd like to tell us about your, your tree, how's it doing? So we're, we're, we're kind of annoying. We'll like follow up with you. We'll like send you emails. Um, we have a three year stewardship program. So we'll follow up with you every once a year for three years to make sure that tree is getting the care that it needs. Or if you're a senior or if you're disabled, we'll go remove that stake for you for free. Um, so we do a lot of like, we'll get you some mulch for free. Um, so we're, we're trying everything I can to, to get that. Some trees that we plant, especially in public places, 
it's it's everyone's tree. So what happens? It's it's no one's tree. Um, <laughs> people fail to steward it. You have a great Boy Scout group to go plant trees, and then that event is over. And now who's going to water it for three years? So we need to identify someone on site who's going to water. So that could be county parks people. That could be city parks people. That requires a meeting. That requires identifying where water will come from. Maybe it's a maybe it's a neighborhood association nearby. In which case, the parks guys could get the neighborhood association a quick coupler and a hose, and the neighborhood association runs over and waters that tree. Even if they miss a week, it's no big deal. You know, the tree isn't going to die in seven days. Um, it's really about like just getting that tree, you know, established. And if it's every other week, then that community group can come out and water that tree. That's fine too. You know, best practice would be 15 gallons a week. But if it gets 15 gallons every two weeks, it's not really a big deal. Um, as long as it gets some sort of supplemental water that first year to two years, um, that's the most important time. So we have a couple of different models. And then our last model is we have a watering truck and we'll go around and we'll try to water trees in specific settings, especially along roads or those weird little triangle pieces or circular places up against roads that don't have an irrigation system or aren't hooked up to community water in any way. They're just sort of these, I'm sure you've seen them. When you when you go around those roundabouts to get on a highway or something, there's oftentimes these just like patches of grass. So we plant trees there sometimes. Um, and sometimes we'll just go there with a big hose and gravity um, water a couple trees. We try not to do that one because of safety concerns and our capacity. We only have this one watering truck that can hold a thousand gallons and if every tree needs 10 to 15, we can't get to that many in a day, um, but we try. And we do that with recycled water. So we fill up our tanks with recycled water and we try. But the stewardship model and the, the community supervisor model are the ones that we use the most um, because we can't monitor 65,000 trees that we planted. It's beyond our capacity. We only have a staff of like six to 10. So it's just not gonna happen. <laughs> Well, even with a staff of six to 10, you all are small and mighty. It is really neat to hear about all that you are doing. And I, each time we work together, I'm just so impressed by the value that you bring to this community. And I, I'll, I'll continue to say how grateful I am to be able to learn from you. Um, I'm gonna wrap it up with one more question since we are at time. I've recognized many folks have been asking about fruit trees. So I'll go with this specific example in the Q&A. If somebody has a fruit tree that is mature, say around seven years old, what would you suggest as a schedule for drip irrigation for a fruit tree? Well, I've never, I've never um, put together drip irrigation. So that answer uh, is outside of my mind. Um, <laughs> I would try to get that tree at least, you know, 15 gallons every month, I think would be the minimum for that tree. Um, you'll notice with the fruits, if you um, allow that tree to dry out and then water it too much all at once. Have you ever had a tomato kind of burst because you've watered it too much? Sometimes that happens with plums or apricots. Yeah. Um, the organization I work for just sort of doesn't focus on fruit trees as much just because we focus more on environmental benefits of community trees and shade benefits and canopy benefits. Um, so fruit tree questions might be better sent to, you know, entities that deal more with urban agroforestry um, or urban agriculture. Um, one that I work with a lot is, is Master Gardeners. Um, the other one I work with a lot is, is Veggie Lucian based in San Jose. Um, they do great work with edible gardens and creating spaces that serve as a food source as well as have environmental benefits. Um, our city forest does sell some fruit trees and they just require more consistent water um, through time. So it's a lot, it's another one of those trees that um, just requires, you know, you can't just leave it alone once it's established like you can with an oak tree. Um, you would have to give it a little bit of supplemental water. Um, I would check with uh, UC Davis has some good fact sheets on trees and and um, fruit trees and nut trees as well. Hmm. Nice. Thank you for those resources and, and great indicators of how you can tell if a, a tree or a plant is receiving too much water. And I'd even go on to add that many cities are now implementing drought restrictions and mandates and they're limiting when and at what frequency you can irrigate your plants. So that might even help you better determine how much water can I give this plant and really 
being in tune with your garden is so important to be able to recognize the leaves look different, the fruit look different from year to year. And we are so fortunate to live in a time where we have the resources at our disposal. I'm sure with many Google searches, you could determine this yellow leaf is a result of this, this, and this. Um, I do also want to uplift Michael in the chat as people continue to sign off. There has been an overwhelming amount of gratitude for your appreciation and your knowledge. Um, and I just want to thank you all for continuing to be here with us, for asking all of your questions. Michael, Mary, the Valley Water team, thank you for allowing us to uplift this message, to have this presentation. And again, for anybody who has questions after the fact, I'll be sending a follow-up resource with the recording, with additional resources that have been mentioned throughout the presentation, with contact information. We're here for you all. Thank you for your efforts. Thank you for your desire to conserve and reuse water and maintain a healthy or improve the health of our planet and to maintain the health of our, our water system and our cycles and our trees. Uh, we, we couldn't do it without you all. And every small and daily action that we take is incredibly valuable. Um, so thank you. With that, I think I'm going to wrap this presentation for our panelists and Michael. I will see you all on the other side in our other Zoom meeting where we will wrap. Thank you all so much. And I hope to see you again in the future. Have a great evening. Good night.